everyone. My name is Derek Covington Smith, and I'm going to be your host for Spotlight On. Spotlight On is an interview podcast where we talk to different artists working and living in Mississippi. When I moved back to Mississippi, I opened up my studio, the Little Yellow Building, and began teaching. And once the coronavirus hit and really settled in, it became quite lonely. As artists, we're always used to having a lonely studio practice and being one-on-one -on -one with ourselves. But when you take out the option of having that community, it becomes really hard. And that's where Spotlight On was born. I started reaching out to artists all over Mississippi and interviewing and learning more about their lives. I'd like to invite you to come along and join me as we talk to everyone and anyone who wants to share their art and their life with us. So I hope you tune in. I hope you subscribe and join us for Spotlight On. Hey, everyone, and thanks for joining us again for Spotlight On. We are joined this week by Whitson Sasser Patrick Ramsey. That's a uh, Four of the coolest names that you could ever put together, but um, for, for our purposes, this is Whitson Ramsey. Um, Whitson, thank you for being here with us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background in art and what you do? Thanks for having me. Um, I am a painter from um, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and um, my background in art um, doesn't really have a definite beginning. I always was a creative kid. And, um, in the short answer, I kind of just never grew out of it. Um, I was always building things and painting growing up. And, uh, once I got to high school, I kind of was introduced to the possibility of being an artist, uh, professionally, um, rather than just seeing it as a hobby, which beforehand I never really considered. Um, so then, uh, I went to college at the university of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg and got my degree in painting and drawing. And, um, I don't know, once I, once I, once I got to college, I realized that like, I really didn't care for being a student. I didn't like being in school. And if, if I wasn't there for painting, I probably wouldn't have been in college at all. Um, that was kind of the only thing that really pulled me there, but in the end, I'm ultimately super happy that I went because I was opened up to this world of painting that I only had such a narrow definition of before. Um, so it's funny, <laughs> even though I am kind of, I don't want to say entirely anti academia because I am also an art teacher um, during the day, which sounds kind of hypocritical, but I, I just bureaucracy of the school system and that sort of stuff just really drives me nuts. Um, so things like art and painting and those sort of classes are kind of the saving grace for some people, you know, where, uh, academia no longer feels so structured. You can actually have some sort of creative, um, wherewithal. So, um, that's kind of how I got started. Um, I originally was going into art to pursue, to pursue, um, art education. Cause that's again, the only professional exposure I'd ever gotten through art. Um, but then uh, pretty soon after starting classes in college, I decided that, uh, I just wanted to go into painting full time. Um, and then after graduating, then I realized I needed a job. So, <laughs> uh, then I went back to the teaching idea. And, uh, so now where I am is, uh, kind of nice. Cause I, I teach full time at a high school, teach painting. And then, um, I, also get to go go home every day and work out of my studio and paint. So it's, um, I mean, really like having two full-time jobs of art, you know? So uh, it's very all uh, encompassing, I guess. How is get, that, uh, that work-life balance for you? How is it, you know, teaching and then coming home and, and kind of dropping the educational side, dropping all the rules and regulations of art and going into your own personal practice? No, right. It's, uh, at first it was kind of a hard shift to make. But then after, uh, after a while, uh, I really kind of figured out the best, uh, time management. And now I'm able to use my commute back home from work as a way to kind of shift gears, come down from my education point of view, and then get back into my painting point of view. So by the time I get home, I'm just kind of excited and ready to get, ready to get to the studio. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, 
you kind of always hear like the that stupid phrase, like those who can do and those who can't teach. Uh, but uh, there's also a third part that no one ever talks about that you can do both, you know? Um, so in a way, like when I'm te- teaching during the day, it's almost like, even though I'm teaching the students, I'm also kind of teaching myself and getting myself excited uh, to get back to work uh, when I get home, when I get to my studio. So it kind of has a two-way street there, you know? Yeah. Um, I had Mary, um, an artist named Mary Hardy on the podcast uh, a couple of episodes ago, and she was also a teacher, and she has since retired, but she and I both were talking about how nice it was to have the confidence when you step back into the studio after you've taught classes. Um, you have like solidified all of your art knowledge and you get to turn around and use it. Um, you have some really interesting projects going on that I'd like to talk about. You have these uh, Polaroid portraits, Polaroids that you're doing. Um, for me, they're very uh, Warhol-esque from the factory. It's, it's um, just these cool profiles of these individuals in your life. And then you're turning those into these large um, color field type paintings, these washes of, um, of color that build into these uh, beautiful large portraits. Tell us about that and how that started. Yeah, um, well, the the Polaroid aspect of it started with quarantine. Um, before that, I was still doing figurative work, but it was always from a live model. Um, and the subjects have always been people that are in my life, friends, family, etc. Um, once quarantine hit, and I realized I didn't have the means to uh, have people sit for me. Um, that's when I started using photography, and I've really become obsessed with Polaroid photography, the idea of the instant photo is great. And then also the photo as an object rather than just an image. Um, so I shifted gears pretty immediately to that um, and started taking pictures of myself and of my wife and other friends that were kind of in our bubble, you know. Um, and then since uh, people have gotten a little bit more used to uh, the COVID lifestyle, um, you know, small social gatherings, one on one sort of things have become a little bit more uh, appropriate again. So, uh, then getting pictures from those sort of moments, um, which also was a kind of an interesting thing. I mean, this is definitely a body of work that's going to keep going beyond COVID, but, um, hanging out with people, being around other people during COVID times is really interesting because you, you're not going to waste any time being around people you don't want to be around. Yeah. So, (laughs) yeah. So all the people that I have interacted with that I've taken these portraits of, you know, I, I'm aware and they're aware that that time is really precious. Um, but yeah, so the Polaroids as like a small object as an actual image and something physical. And there's, you know, they're so small, roughly three inches. Um, and then blowing those up on a scale that's way larger than life, um, is kind of an interesting thing. I like that kind of dichotomy of that scale contrast, how does the same image translate to the viewer when the only thing that's changed ultimately is that scale? Um, And so considering the image and then considering the painting side by side or one at a time, how does that translate to you? When you look at the Polaroids, especially when you're holding them, you are interacting with that object where you are confronting that object. But when you're in front of a painting that's very large in size and scale, then you are the one being confronted in that moment, if that makes sense. So uh, taking these images that I deeply care for and then kind of playing with the space and the physical interaction um, is kind of a big thing for me. Yeah, that's it makes for a uh, I mean, well, and. I don't know how you plan on displaying. Like you said, this has all been built since quarantine um, and, and COVID. But seeing the, the representation that's that far drawn in scale um, and getting to at least experience a realistic moment that is in itself a piece of art because it, it can't, it's not digital. It's not reproduced. This is it. This is that tangible thing. And being able to stand next to the art artist representation of the soul of that image. Um, Cause especially with all the layers of colors and how thinly you use them and how transparent and loose they are, it feels like the painting has soul. 
it has something inside of it as well. And so does the Polaroid. It's it, They're different, but they relate so well. Um, I've, I'm thoroughly enjoying that. Um, I do. I want to ask you about something else that you're involved in. Um, you're involved with uh, the Warm Milk Creative. Um, is it? It's a zine, right? Yeah. Well, Warm Milk Creative is sort of an umbrella term. Uh, it kind of falls into two categories. There's Warm Milk Recording, which is for music, um, and then there's Warm Milk Publishing, which is the zine, uh, art, and poetry side of it. And I. Yeah, so me and a couple of friends started that in 2015. And um, just in the past two years, the publishing side has really started to flourish and become its own thing. Um, so yeah, I am the visual arts editor for Warm Milk Publishing. And um, we are currently reviewing submissions for our second um, issue, um, which we're hoping to kind of get out sometime around New Year's. Okay. Um, but that's a really fun project because me and the other people that are involved, none of us live nearby each other anymore. We're all kind of scattered. Um, one of them's in uh, Ireland and the other one is in uh, Georgia right now. And so um, it's a really good way to keep all, all of us in contact with one another and collaborating still, you know. Um, I didn't realize it was that that spread out. Like I knew yeah, there were I mean, several of you working on it, but I didn't realize it was that far. Right. Yeah. And we're all from Mississippi but uh, we've just kind of all shifted away. Um, so it's a great way for us to keep working together on different projects. Um, but also it's a really fun way to work with um, artists that we like. Um, you know, we're by no means like a major um, publisher or anything. So a lot of the representation that we've been able to work with has been through people that we are really excited about. Um, and there's something just really wholesome about kind of really getting to work and be excited with these artists that we like on a small scale where you can tell there's a lot of kind of soul being put into that project. Um, that's been super exciting. We've worked with, I mean, at this point now with just these two issues and with the music side of things, we, we've worked with artists from all across the world. And uh, it's been such a cool way to stay in touch with people that it's kind of unique. And, you know, it's a different process than just reaching out and, shooting a message on Instagram or something, you know, actually working on a, on a thing with somebody, um, you really get to share sort of just a moment with these artists, um, that not everyone gets to have, you know, what an incredible experience and it really also is. so much fun. What a cool platform, right? So you're, you're not only like providing this experience for the viewer, but you're, you're providing this really cool platform that's unique and, and elevates you know, artists, that you might not have seen, you might not have run across before. That's it's something that's always worth doing. And I appreciate it. Definitely. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, another thing I think is worth mentioning is that, um, we don't take profits from any of the sales. All of our sales are donation based. Um, so any money that goes into warm milk, um, goes back into the printing of the next one. You know, it's, it's, you, you pay what you want for, for the physical copy or for the digital copy. Um, and so what a, it's completely up to the viewer, uh, so we, you know, art should definitely be something that's accessible to all people. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, it's pay what you want as long as you cover the shipping costs, which is like maybe $2. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you have, you're involved with another project, um, that's called the artist support pledge. Yeah. That's a little bit more of a broad thing. I mean, it, it's, I think anyone can kind of take part in that it's more of a like an honor system um it's it's a great great thing i've really been excited to be a part of even informally you know uh the whole idea of that started around quarantine and uh it's just you sell your artwork for a reduced price um and every thousand dollars you make is the benchmark that that pledge works with every thousand dollars that you make from sales you turn 200 of that around to buy from another artist. Wow. Uh, so just, it, it just keeps that cycle of supporting each other. Um, you know, and that that's, could, yeah, that's extremely impactful. Yeah, it's great. And, uh, I love collecting artwork from artists that I like people that are in my circle and people that I just enjoy looking at. And, uh, that's been a really good experience for me to collect art from other people that I've previously wanted to, but not really had the chance to, um, 
And then vice versa. I've had people that have bought my work that I was really excited for them to own something of mine. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, it's a little bit more uh, informal of a project, I guess, because anyone can just be involved with it. It's like I said, it really really relies on that honor system, but uh, it seems like everyone who's involved with that takes it very seriously and has a lot of fun with it. Got it. That's, yeah, that's really, I don't, it's important. It's important for us to all support each other, but it's also important for us to find each other and, um, and connect and owning a piece of another artist's work. You know, what goes into making that work, you know, what type of a process and what type of a, um, how soul wrenching it can be. And to be a part of this, where you hold another artist piece of work, you're connected forever. Like you, you have a story, you have the whole event and, and you putting yourself out there and getting a piece of somebody else. And that's a, that'll keep everyone in touch for at least as long as we can right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah agreed. Um, I was going to say something. I just lost it. <laughs> You've got uh, my disease. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember. Uh, so being in Mississippi, I mean, nothing against Mississippi, but we don't have the resources that people from say like New York or Los Angeles or, you know, Chicago uh, might have. And we do have some really great institutions and I, I live really close to the Lauren Rogers museum of art in Laurel. Um, and then I've, I've been a frequent visitor my whole life to the museum of Jackson. And so, I mean, we have resources, but they're not amply available like you would find in other places. So this sort of platform has been a great way just to get involved with artists elsewhere too, you know, and also show, you know, I've had people respond to, to my action with the pledge and all of that saying like, I had no idea this sort of stuff was even going on in Mississippi. Who knew that art happened there? Uh, so it's actually been a really fun, the past nine, 10 months, uh, however long it's been, <laughs> um, it's been a really cool way to just get, uh, kind of get us on the map a little bit and just kind of make everyone aware that Mississippi has a lot to offer, you know? And then also owning artwork from people all across the world uh, is a really cool experience too because i get to just be in my living room in hattiesburg mississippi and look at art from france and england and new york and wherever else from just people that i enjoy looking at so it's it's kind of a weird uh experience honestly (laughs) well to bring this all back around to you um if you were talking to anyone that may not know you and may not know your work and when they walk away, what do you want them to walk away with? What, what do they want? What do you want them to know about Whitson? Yeah. Um, I guess I'll do a little bit of a little backpedaling here, uh, with, with my work specifically, um, a big thing that I get out of it personally as the maker and the viewer is, uh, my paintings and the photographs, just all of my work is in a way a pretty big, uh, coping strategy with dealing with anxiety. Um, I have a lot of social anxiety and it gets, there's, there's times where it gets really, uh, crippling in a way. And, um, and it's really upsetting to me because as hard as I work on it, um, through therapy and practice and all that sort of stuff, um, there are times where it still wins, you know, and, um, it's upsetting to me because the anxiety that I experience keeps me from times from, uh, you know, letting a relationship with a friend or a family member grow to what I wish it could be because I I am getting in my own way. And, um, so these paintings, uh, have kind of become a a way for me to come to terms with that where, you know, I might get a portrait of somebody and really spend a couple weeks making a painting of them, giving them the time I wish I, or I, even the time I wish that I could have given them or the time that I think that, I, they deserve, you know, uh, where in person I might kind of cower away from that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. The process of making these paintings is like a way for me to, uh, kind of show my appreciation for the people that I am involved with. You know, I'm not making paintings based on found photographs of people. I don't know. I'm not making, you know, I'm not creating it out of my head. It's, you know, it's very much the subject is very much 
an integral part of what I'm painting. Um, so I would hope for someone else coming out of my work, looking at my work, what they would walk away with was at least just catching on to the attention to uh, the care and love that it goes into making it. Um, emotionally for me, they're really difficult images. Um, just because it, it just reminds me of everything that I think of when it comes to being around other people. Um, so even though that's not everyone's experience and that's not going to be anybody's experience except for my own with that specifically, I hope that someone looking at my paintings would uh, have some sort of empathetic uh, response to it. Just feeling that care that goes into it, you know, yeah. um, I'm not a photorealistic painter, even though I, my paintings stylistically fall into some sort of realism category because I'm not trying to recreate a photograph. I'm trying to recreate a moment. I'm trying to recreate just a feeling that I get around a certain person. Right. Right. That's, thank you for sharing that. Um, I, we go through a lot as individual people and you never know who can reflect themselves or who can see themselves reflected in you or your work. And to be able to hear that you struggle with that anxiety with all that you do, right. Even, even though you've got these projects going on, even though you go in and teach every day, you, you still struggle with the same thing that some others might relate to. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's no shame in having it. So, uh, might as well embrace it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is, I will say it is, it is a strange situation for me, at least I feel it is that, uh, having anxiety and, um, you know, sort of having that sort of reaction to being around a lot of people while at the same time, desperately craving people's, uh, company. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. like you are getting in your own way to get what you want. You know, it's, it's kind of a strange uh, mix. So. <laughs> so one last question and I'll let you go. Um, Whitson, for any artist that's coming up behind us, what, what advice would you give to them? Um, man, uh, there's so many ways I could answer this. Um, I guess coming from my own experience, my own sort of um, like moments of revelation, those little aha moments that you have. Um, I mean, everyone kind of needs to come across those on their own. But uh, just from my experience, coming out of school, coming out of a, a degree that was very academically focused in terms of painting, you know, very formal, very... Uh, you know, buy the books, this is how you do this, you know, everything seems so structured. Um, when you no longer have that floating around your head and you're on your own in your studio um, and you don't have school to worry about, you don't have deadlines, you don't have projects, it's all up to you or you are your own boss and you could fire yourself at any moment. Um, learning how to basically abandon everything that you've learned and then pick it back up one piece at a time all depending on what you find that you need. You know, there are times that I have thought of something while I'm painting and think like, okay, this is something that I learned in school and that's great. I'm going to use it. And there's another thing that I learned that I'm just going to completely throw out the window because it doesn't apply to who I am. You know, it's, um, uh, you have to learn the rules to break them in a way. But, uh, I think the encouraging part is, is learning how you break them. What's, what makes, what makes you the thing that stands out? Um, cause ultimately, I mean, there are definitely formal ways to look at art. There's ways that art can be objectively better than others. Um, but I think in the end of all that, if, if you are not present in the art making, then what's the point, you know? I mean, I, not to, I'm not even pointing out any specific people. I'm just thinking like, you see the art that you, that you could buy at like home goods or something, you know, or at department stores or target that people would buy and put on their walls. Um, and there are people who make art that actually look like that. <laughs> and there's, I mean, what's, I just can't see the point in making art that is simply just pretty and decorative. And surely you as a human being have something deeper inside of you. Um, so that's, that's something I'm, I'm kind of always thinking of is like, 
and this would be some advice, I guess, is like, how much of you is in there and how much of you are you comfortable putting in there and whatever you're not comfortable with, put a little bit of that in there anyway. You know, like be, being vulnerable is very important in art because, um, you know, ultimately it comes down to who the artist is and what, you know, what they have to say. Um, and then also another thing for up and coming artists that I would really encourage is, uh, those first couple of years when you're on your own and trying to figure things out, like try everything, you know, what, just because you just finished school and whatever your like senior thesis project was, that is not what you're going to be painting for the rest of your life. Uh, you know, seriously, try, uh, taking some huge risks, paint things you never would expect to paint, paint, uh, you know, paint in ways that you would never think to do and use colors that you hate and, you know, paint, paint like your least favorite painter and see what happens. Um, you know, just there's, there's such a, there's such a stigma of like being an art student and then you graduate and then now you work at McDonald's or something. And I feel like that only happens to the people who really don't take it seriously. Um, and even then you work at McDonald's, that's fine. What do you do when you get home? Do you go to your studio or do you not paint? You know? So, uh, it's not an easy career and it's not an easy job, but, uh, you get out of it what you put into it, you know? Um, I can't remember who, who quoted this, but it's something I've always kind of held dear to me. It's like painting is a hard way to make a living, but it's a hell of a way to make a life. And that is such, that is just on the money for me. Yeah. No one's going to be making these like blue chip gallery salaries that you see in the, you know, on all these headlines of painting sold for $2 million or whatever. Like no real people don't make that sort of money. And uh, being an artist, you're really not going to be making a lot of money, at least for a long time. Um, So you kind of have to learn how to live with that instead of living against it. Yeah. Learning how to self-generate and how to, how to stay afloat while you're putting yourself into your practice. Yeah. Cause I think with true, true art, um, with nothing held back, there are, there's no room for excuses. Um, you know, there's, of course there are times where it's totally fine to take a little break, you know, catch your breath and all of that. But, um, there's so little room for people in the art world, uh, because, there's just no room for phonies, you know? Um, yeah. so if, if you were, if you're in it, you have to be in it. There's, there's no, uh, you know, one foot in one foot out, like <laughs> the head, it's a head first dive into the water. So. Well, Whitson, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your, your art life with us, sharing your, your, your practice and how you work and what you care about and sharing your advice. Um, for anyone that wants to find you, it's WhitsonRamsey.com and that's W H I T S O N R A M S E Y.com. And then you can also find you on, um, Instagram at Sasser Patrick and it's S A S S E R P A T R I C K. Is yep. that right? Yep. Um, and then also, uh, if you wanted to learn more about warm milk, um, it is warm milk creative, uh, um, on Instagram and, uh, warm milk publishing.com. Um, we have our second volume coming out around the new year and, uh, we've already kind of got some ideas of our next projects to follow that. So just be on the lookout for any open calls or news about future publications. Absolutely. And this, this episode, um, and this episode will go up probably around, um, late February or March. So, you know, uh, go back and look at volume one. You can now get volume two. Um, and hopefully there'll be a volume three out for a uh, call for submissions. You can check out something like that. Um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I can't express to you how much it means to me to have all of these artists willing to come on and, and share what their lives are all about, because it's important for us to connect and learn about each other. Um, for everyone else, I will We'll be back again next week with a new artist and a new point of view. Until then.